Today on the Everything 80s Podcast, Big League Chew, the bubblegum of your childhood. Hey guys, what's happening? Welcome back to the Everything 80s Podcast. I'm Jamie. Thanks for coming on out today. And we're talking about that variety store 7-Eleven go-to choice that was mixed in among all the different candy selections, chocolate bars. We're talking Big League Chew, the ultimate bubble gum, the one that made you feel like you were using chewing tobacco. And that has a lot to do with its actual creation. So this episode will be a look back at how Big League Chew was developed, its popularity, the launching of it, how it's made, all that good stuff. But before we start, make sure if you haven't already subscribed wherever you find your podcast, I should be there, whether it's Spotify, Apple Podcast, iHeartRadio, any of those platforms. Okay, let's do this. In case you don't know what Big League Chew is or was, it's a pink shredded gum that was invented in 1980 by former baseball player Rob Nelson as a chewing tobacco substitute. It was first made by the Wrigley Company and is now manufactured by Ford Gum and Machine Company. It has sold over 800 million pouches and is considered in the Hall of Fame of bubble gum. So I don't know what your local variety store is like uh, as a kid, but I feel Big League Chew was placed front and center just to catch my eye. As much as I told myself I was going to get something new each time I went in there, I kept on buying Big League Chew. Every kid likes gum, but Big League Chew made it so much more fun and, and again, almost adult-like as it came from a pouch just like chewing tobacco did. We watch baseball players use this all the time, and I think some of the appeal was that you weren't supposed to be mimicking it. I think this was a similar effect you would get with something like Popeye cigarettes. You were allowed to have them, but it still felt a bit rebellious. So here's the story of the bubble gum of every kid's childhood. So let's set the stage for Big League Chew. So it starts in the dugout and on the bench. Like I had mentioned, you know, chewing tobacco had been a mainstay of baseball pretty much since day one. Unbeknownst to the old timers, this stuff was pretty bad for you, but it had always been part of the culture. It's funny, look back on old clips from the 70s and 60s, and you would see guys just smoking in the dugouts um, in between plays. This is when you didn't have to exactly be healthy to be an athlete. I love baseball, but, you know, there's a lot of, let's say, downtime during the game. And what better way to pass the time than with chewing tobacco? Smokeless tobacco, as it's referred to, had been banned in ballparks and dugouts in 2016. It was found in 2014 that one third of pro ball players were still actively using chewing tobacco, which is pretty insane to think about. If It must have been 100% during, you know, the 20th century. With new rules in place, you're seeing it phase it all together and players now are opting for sunflower seeds or good old-fashioned chewing gum. But the creation of Big League Chew all starts with the son of actor Kurt Russell. Bing Russell was the son of the legendary actor and he was a huge baseball guy. He bought a minor league team in 1973 called the Portland Mavericks. Bing was big on finding players who ate, slept, and breathed baseball. He wanted players that loved the game more than anything, and one of those guys was Rob Nelson. Rob Nelson was a left-handed pitcher who grew up as a big fan of, you know, bubblegum and candy and, you know, the usual things that kids are. He collected a lot of baseball cards, and one of his favorite players was Hall of Famer Nellie Fox. In Nelson's favorite uh, card that he had that was pictured with Fox. It was shown to have him with a huge cheek full of chewing tobacco. He knew he couldn't use the same stuff, so he would chew a lot of gum to create the same look as his hero. Rob would end up following baseball as far as he could and eventually got a trout and made it on to the Mavericks. There was a player on the team named Todd Field who would always cut up black vine licorice, and Rob would seem to subconsciously make a note of this. Rob had asked what he was chewing, and Field told him and said he was using it instead of tobacco. Rob then asked if he could do the same thing with gum, and Field assumed he could. That was it for the moment, and it would be a year until Rob would revisit the idea. During the season of 1977, Rob went up to Field and asked him if it should be in a tin. Field had no idea what he was talking about, and Rob mentioned the idea of the gum again, and it should be in a tin like chewing tobacco. 
They thought that chewing tobacco should be in a tin, but gum should come in a pouch. This is something they wanted to use on the bench, but didn't want to look like little kids in front of their teammates by sticking big pieces of bubble gum in their mouth. Rob wondered if having it shredded like the chewing tobacco would make it easier for them to fit in. The idea for a healthy form of chewing tobacco was born right there, and even the name Big League Chew was created right away. They played around with a few others such as Red Steer Chew, Maverick Chew, and All Star Chew. So now they wanted to take the next steps with this product they've invented. Rob had a teammate named Jim Bouton who had played for the Yankees, and Rob approached him about helping get this idea off the ground. Bouton designed the image on the pouch, which was based on himself in a baseball uniform. This would give the impression that this would be a product meant for children. Bouton put up $10,000 to get a patent on Big League Chew, and this was right after Nelson had stopped playing baseball. Bouton was still pitching in the minors in 1978, though. Nelson had gone to see him to keep this idea alive, and it's when Bouton invested the money. Bouton had good connections, but his focus was still on getting back to the major leagues, so it was hard for him to promote anything at the time. Rob Nelson wanted the money to patent and protect the idea, but the problem was you couldn't patent the idea of shredding gum. You could, however, trademark the name and the packaging that it came in. This was perfect. Now they could take the product to show the companies. The problem was they didn't have any actual product. They hadn't even created the gum yet. Rob would order a gum-making kit out of the back of a magazine, got some empty pouches that they mocked up some logos for, got some food coloring and some licorice flavor. The mixture was put together and came out looking like a sheet of thin brownies. They then used a pizza cutter to cut it into thin strips. And it tasted like crap. (laughs) Booten and Rob Nelson didn't care. They knew they had a good idea on their hand and everything could be enhanced and improved later on. So now they try to get Big League Chew on the market. They found an art studio to make the proper logo for the pouch that was a cartoon likeness of Jim Bouton in his Yankee pinstripes. And they started to shop it around. They approached Tops and Fleers, but they would not be interested in it. After six months of shopping it around everywhere, they found a company called Amaral, and they were a subsidiary of the Wrigley Company, the same one that owns the Chicago Cubs. Amaral was working in sugarless candy, but it was not going so well, so they needed something to get back into the mix. Big League Chew looked like the right fit, and their chemist had been able to create a very good shredded gum. The team of them flew out to Chicago to start testing it, and they put 15 to 20 pouches in a nearby convenience store to see what the response would be. They then left for lunch and would come back to observe how the kids responded to it. They get to the store and find out all the pouches have been cleared out in 10 minutes. So now they're ready to negotiate. So now it's time to launch Big League Chew. One issue was that Wrigley didn't want to be associated in any way with Big League Chew because they didn't want any connection to a tobacco product, even if it was a pretend one. The chemists also had a problem. They had to find a way to make the shreds of gum taste unlike any other type of gum on the market. They also needed it to not stick together in the pouch and be loose the same way chewing tobacco was. They solved all these problems and finally had the product down and could make a package from mixing to packaging in two days. Along with that, they also had a great logo of a rugged ball player on the pouch and rolled out Big League Chew in the spring of 1980. In the first year, Big League Chew made $18 million. This is pretty insane because Amaral as a company was only worth $8 million and this one product was worth more than twice what their company was. I don't know if you remember this also, but they released the pouches with Popeye in the front as uh, as a way to promote it um, to younger kids and really push it. These ones did not sell nearly as well, though, but it didn't matter because Big League Chew was going through the roof. Rob Nelson states how it got 10 times bigger than what their wildest dream expectations were. They knew how to appeal to kids and market to kids. And as one of those kids, I can tell you it worked very well. Because of Big League Chew, they actually became the biggest novelty manufacturing company in the world at the time. Their company went from $2 million to $126 million. And this is in the early 80s. So when converted for today, it's more in the neighborhood of $350 million. Also, that $8 million the first year would be the equivalent of around $52 million. That's a lot of shredded gum. So this, you know, part looks now into... The future Big League Chew, but then, you know, the controversy that would come along with it. So 
After just two years, Big League Chew had made $27 million and would then level off a bit, but still, in, still pull in 10 to $12 million a year. The interesting thing is that these sales stayed incredibly steady over the years. It wasn't just a one-time fad. Rob Nelson would eventually buy out his partner, Jim, and then Wrigley would sell their interest to a company called Ford Gum. The Mars company was buying out Wrigley for $23 billion, and Rob and crew didn't want Big League Chew to be caught up in a bigger corporation and potentially lose their factory, so they had talked Wrigley into selling to Ford Gum. They've also played around with the flavors over the years and added in, if you remember, a neon green one, which had a sort of sour apple flavor to it. And there's also a bright purple version, which was grape flavor. Regardless of the variety, they are still pumping out 100,000 pouches a day. Big League Chew has still gone strong over the years, but the controversy surrounding it was the thought that a package of shredded chewing gum was instilling the idea of chewing tobacco in a young kid's mind. The thought was similar to companies like Joe Camel being used uh, as a cartoon to catch the eye of kids and, you know, maybe draw them in as future consumers someday. There's this idea of uh, they call anthropomorphism where using a cartoon likeness of an animal really appeals to kids because kids are drawn to animals already. And then cartoon animals is like the next level. So it's why you see cartoon animals used to always sell kids products, specifically like cereals. A big issue was that it was called chew, the same way that people uh, would refer to chewing tobacco. Some had the idea that Big League Chew was glorifying chewing tobacco and was not a responsible product. This was never the case with the creators because they were not wanting to go the route of chewing tobacco and they were looking for a substitute when they created it. I don't remember my parents frowning on the use of Big League Chew the way they kind of had maybe some issues with Popeye cigarettes. and I just remember that being an issue with you know, other parents and teachers, the Popeye cigarettes were, everyone knew what the intent was and what it was trying to mimic. With Big League Chew, it was still gum. I'm now just making this connection with Popeye and tobacco-based products here when Big League Chew used them over the years as well. So we'll start wrapping it up here. If you're like me, Big League Chew is a massive part of your childhood. When I think of a you know, a tangible product from the 80s that wasn't a toy, this is one of the things that always comes to mind. There was nothing more exciting than going to a convenience store and seeing all the novelty candies and products and seeing that distinctive pouch. Chewing gum goes hand in hand with childhood and Big League Chew is the ultimate gum. To me, it's still the best chewing gum ever made and nothing can compare with its softness, its chewiness and that it lend itself to probably the best bubbles of any gum. Here's a fun fact. Bubbles blow best once all the sugar is dissolved from chewing. And that's a tip from the head of Ford gum. So if you're about to blow bubbles, wait till you've chewed it for a little while to get rid of most of that sugar. Every pack was so fresh when you open it and it had that distinctive smell. Again, it was, it was so chewy and tasty. You almost wanted to eat it compared to those, you know, rock hard varieties like Bazooka Joe or those Um, wooden pieces of stick gum that came in any form of like hockey or baseball card packaging. So this is just a quick episode that, you know, looks back into a little more of the backstory and the history of some iconic products and, and things that everyone at some point has eaten or used. And it is interesting, like I said, that Big League Chew is still available in stores now. It just it didn't go away after a year. It didn't go away after 10 years. The thing is still around and available and you can get it everywhere. So thanks for joining me on this little time travel back to your childhood variety or convenience store. Mine was called the Hasty Market at the end of our street, actually more around the corner where we would go find Big League Chew and you probably had your own place where you got it too. But thanks for checking this show out. I know there's a ton of podcasts out there. So the fact you're taking your time to listen to something like this means a lot to me. Again, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you really like it, hook me up with a rating and review. That way more people get to check out the show too. But thanks for spending your time with me. I'll talk to you later. Bye.